MMA Oddsbreaker. Of course, this week we have Chael Sonnen back on our show again. Thanks for taking a break from your vacations vacation to uh, take some time to talk with us. Yeah, man, what a mess. I'm, I'm out here in uh, I'm out here in Hawaii. I'm having a great time. What are you up to? Um, in downtown LA right now, a little pissed off because you're in Hawaii. It's gray skies, just finished raining. Uh, it's uh, uh, not not the perfect Southern California weather that I was anticipating. But uh, now that I know you're well, that's, I'm actually happy to hear that. But the main motivation for coming to Hawaii is to make other people jealous. So my, my mission is accomplished for the day. Well, you know, you may not know this, but Hawaii is like uh, my second home. I probably spend about three months a year there, bouncing, you know, a couple weeks here, a couple weeks there, out there doing, you know, working on Hawaii Five-0 and some other projects are out there, but also just sitting on the beach, looking at the waves, doing nothing. Um, that sounds wonderful. That sounds you, a lot like my life today. Do, yeah. Do you need that time? Like, because because you have so much going on, even when you don't have anything going on, you still have your irons in the fire in 14 different places. Do you actually need that time to sit on a beach and go... I'm just going to shut my head off for a couple of days and just kind of relax. Do you actually enjoy that? You know, I do a little bit. I like to be busy, though. Um, you know, I like to have stuff going on. So uh, a little downtime is nice. But, but no, I don't, need, I don't need too much of it. But, you know, Hawaii is just such a unique place, man. It, it's just such a beautiful place. And, and it's relaxing. And the energy's right. And the people are happy. And, and the food's great. You know, it's, it's one of those situations where you can't go wrong. But too much downtime, I, I don't enjoy are you getting any workouts in while you're in Hawaii? No, I haven't. And as a matter of fact, I wrestle at uh, the University of Oregon. There's a guy out there named Shane Kunanen mm -hmm. uh, who wrestled at Oregon State at the same time. He went on to be uh, an All-American fifth in the country. But uh, the reason I bring him up is he's running the wrestling program at the local high school. It's about five minutes from where I am right now. And, and every day I want to go in there, and I just I haven't done it yet. But I want to go in, one, to see him, and and two to get a workout. Yeah, my uh, my excuse has always been whenever I can't get a workout when I'm there is because if I'm on break, real vacation, I'm too hungover to get up and do anything from all the sweet drinks I drink the night before. Otherwise, I, I, it, I it, can it, tell you, 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 it is easy to escape workouts when you're on vacation because it's a built-in justification. Right, right. So, well, let's talk about what you're going to do when you come off vacation. You leave Hawaii in a couple of days, a week. How long are you to be there for? You know what, I'm here. I'm here just over another week. Uh, I'm home for a couple of days. Uh, I think two or three, I'm going to fly out. Uh, ben Askren is wrestling uh, Clayton Foster uh, in a match that he should get whipped in, but when it's Ben, ben Askren, you never know. The, the guy doesn't follow the rules. He seems to just always get his hand raised. But uh, I'm going to go out and call that match. Uh, it's, it's a part of Flow Wrestling's Flow Premier League. And Ben generally calls the matches. He's generally an announcer, but in this case, he's the main event. Uh, so I'm going to go out there and have a great season and, and call that match. And, and then I come home from that, I go right back out to ESPN. We're going to go live uh, on location for Anderson Silva versus uh, Nick Diaz in Las Vegas, uh, which I'm really looking forward to. Well, make sure you hit me up when you're in Vegas. I'll actually be in town for that one. I'm staying home. Usually I end up having to travel on UFC fight weekends, but that weekend I'm actually in and around and so you better make sure I'll be I will be upset if you come into my town and don't text me. You get into Vegas, you don't no, text you me. Deal. I, I definitely will. Man, that's a compelling match. Speaking of, that's a really really interesting match for me. And, and you know, here and apparently I'm not the only one. Here, here's a, a example: Daniel Cormier and John Jones. That was my most anticipated fight in UFC history. That was the one that me as a fan. I wanted to see in the energy, and it got delayed, and the press conference, just the whole bit. That that was the one that had me. That fight did not sell out. And with that in mind, the Anderson Silva Nick Diaz fight sold out before Jones Cormier even even went on. Their their fight Diaz Silva was sold out. Well, Cormier and, and Jones, my most anticipated fight, still had had tickets for sale. So apparently, I'm not the only one that finds this very interesting. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there, there is there's usually pressure for me to leave town and now there's pressure for me to stay in town during this and I'm, I'm a nobody when it comes to 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 interviewing and broadcast work and, and journalism when it comes to UFC stuff they just but it's the pressure to stay put is so amazing with let's not forget that weekend the MMA awards are on Thursday the weigh-ins are on Friday the fight is on Saturday and then on Sunday's the Super Bowl and you know living in Vegas I know that 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 it is one of the top three weekends of every year's Super Bowl weekend in Las Vegas. It's going to be a madhouse 
and everybody's coming in for it. Honestly, the biggest fight of the year could potentially be this, this Silva Diaz fight. Break it down for me. How do you think this fight's actually going to go, especially with Silva coming back off that bad leg break? Well, I, I, I hope you've got time because I, I talk about this fight several times, and one thing I find is that I, I get a little worried, but you know, whenever Anderson Silva's fight, I feel attached in some way, and, and that happens. Sure, you can relate. When you retire, you begin to cling to the guys who you competed with. Regardless of the outcome, you just kind of cling to them. It's, it's, it's one of your connections still left. So, you know, look at the Anderson side of it. Major questions going on. How's he going to be? What's up with this, this leg injury? Put myself in his shoes, man. I, I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you come back. I don't know what your motivation is when you've had the level of success he has both competitively and financially. I, I really don't know exactly what he has uh, to gain, but, but he does. So it's, a, it's an inspiring and very cool thing that he's even uh, coming back. Uh, you look at the other side of it, and you got Diaz. You know, Anderson's been out for a year, but Diaz has been out roughly for eight months more than Anderson. Diaz yeah. retired after the, the St. Pierre fight, you know, and also left the gym in the, in the scene. So they've both been out a while. I think that the weight is a little bit of a factor. Diaz is going up to 185. Uh, if he gains that weight, it could slow him down. Uh, Diaz's biggest weakness in striking, he's an excellent striker, but his weakness has always been leg kicks. Uh, he doesn't block them very well, whether it's it's to the leg, to the to the body, or to the head. He tends to absorb them. And uh, will Anderson even be throwing leg kicks? You know, there's so much going on. The other thing, when you talk about Diaz, he, the only fights he's ever lost, you know, there's a blueprint to beat him. You get him down, you keep him there, you win the round. You know, 15 minutes later, you, you hope the judges see it your way. Nobody's ever outstruck him, at least that I can recall. And, uh, you know, I think Anderson's going to try to take him down let alone how, you know, be successful at it, uh, which means it's a stand-up fight, which means if Diaz loses, he's losing a way that we've never seen before. So I think it's interesting. You know, Anderson's a favorite, but I think Diaz has a, a very good way to go stylistically in this match. Yeah, it's, it's difficult when you're batting against a guy like Diaz who's throwing a 1,000 punches at you in, three, in, three, you know, in 15 minutes. When do you get time to, to return? You know, it takes a lot of time to return. You know, it's so hard to... Throw back at a guy that's always got a fist in your face. Even if it's not doing damage, even if it's not really hurting you, you can't really do anything. And it makes the judges think, hey, this guy must be, he's obviously busier. He's obviously throwing more, throwing more strikes. So he's got to be winning this round if you're not taking him down or, or hurting him at some point. So Silva's got to do some kind of damage to hurt him. And really the only way to hurt a guy that throws that many punches is to leg kick the crap out of him. And I don't think Silva's going to do it because he's still going to be worried. Yeah, I don't either. Yeah. It, it's going to be, and I think that's the intangible. What you just brought up, I think that's the intangible. You know, when you look at who, who's more likely to win or whose skills would you rather have, it, it, you'd probably lean towards Anderson. But the intangible is the fact that it's a main event, which means it's 25 minutes of that Diaz pressure. And you know what? I watched Anderson's fight so closely when I was preparing for him. And one thing that I noticed is he didn't have to do a lot of fighting. Uh, guys were generally so scared of him, they wouldn't step in range, and, and he was able to just move a lot and, and, and look look cool and, and do the footwork and all of that. But when you really engaged him, I thought there was an opportunity there to, to, to push the pace and wear him down a little bit. I think if there's anything we can all agree on, it's that Diaz will fight him. Diaz is going to walk right across that ring and punch him in the face. Yeah. And I think in a 25-minute frame, as you get particularly deeper into it, I think that it, it, it does really favor Diaz. I don't know that you could say that early on, and I don't know if it'll be enough to, to get the job done. Anderson's uh, certainly a talented guy. But this is one of those fights that I think it answers more I think it, it, you have more questions going into it than you do answers, and, and the fight itself, we're all just going to kind of sit back and go, oh, okay, that's, that's what's going to happen. It's, there's just a lot of moving parts there, and I think that Andrew, Anderson's injury, particularly with his age of 39 years old, man, I, I think it matters. And if it doesn't, if I'm wrong, then I'll be even more inspired. Uh, you know, it, it'll make me feel young again. It, it'll yeah. be a cool thing. You you miss uh, uh, you missing the game? Are you missing the hunt? You missing the training camp? You missing missing punching guys in the face? Uh, I'm starting to. You know, I did it when, when everything came down. Uh, for me, there there was uh, tremendous relief. Um, you know, I was I was slammed, and I was here and there in the other place, and. 
I wasn't seeing my wife and I wasn't home and I was living out of hotels and suitcases and this whole bit. There was a bit of an exhale of, oh, gosh, finally, you know, finally. Uh, But, yeah, it does go away. It does. And, and, you know, I'm sure much like you, man, every four years I get Olympic fever. And, yeah. and whether I, I try it or not, I, I get that fever, and I'm I'm uh, I, I'm leaning towards uh, you know trying try and, and I won't be the guy, but I could be one of the guys if I did everything right, and you know, I could I could be one of the guys in in, in Greco, and I I don't see anything wrong with uh I don't think, see anything wrong with trying. Yeah, why not? Are you are you gonna make a uh, are you gonna make a run at it? Are you make a bit at it? I, I'm considering it. I, I, you know, there's 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 a lot of things there. Where, you know, I got to get in a situation in the bar just to to practice. Uh, you know, to wrestle each day, and, and we've got a couple of those opportunities on Oregon. Oregon State's got a great program. In community college, Clackamas Community College, number one junior college in the country, uh, ranked number one, and they are going to win it this year. I'm, wow. I'm quite sure. Uh, and they're right up the road for me. So there is there is some opportunity to do it, but. It's like anything, man. I've, I've got a lot of ideas and a lot of goals and, and only so many hours in the day. So yeah. I'm going to need to make that decision real soon. I, I'm giving myself until February 1st. Uh, and, and I'll either do it or I'll quit talking about it. One of the two. You know, Joe Warren's talking about making another run at it. You know, if he has the right amount of support, he wants to make another run at it. Have you talked to Joe at all about about your situation and want to come back into it? Yeah, I have a little bit, and, and you know, I, I wish I wish a bunch of guys would do it, Frank. I wish that you know we could get a group of guys together and make, make a little commitment. You know, maybe even make our own team and, and enter the nationals as just kind of as a gag. But you know, guys like Joe Warren that are in great shape, guys like Mo the Wall. I, I think Daniel Cormier is the guy. I think he, he I think he could walk right in uh, and be the guy at two different weight classes. I think he could also do it uh, at heavyweight. So. Uh, yeah, but there's a, there's a group of guys out there that are still training. They're in the room each day. You know, Andy Robot, he, he retires from wrestling, but he goes to wrestling practice twice a day, every day. And, and there's some guys that could enter, and it would be different. You know, you can relate. As, as a wrestler, yeah. it wasn't a ton of fun. It was hard. It, it was a, a bunch of pressure. You only had so many opportunities a year to succeed. But if you go back in... Now, at our age, I think we get a group of guys together and go with a different attitude of, you know, let's actually enjoy this sport for a change. Let's go have some fun. Let's let's lower our goals a little bit and, and go out there and, and see what happens and, and wrestle without that pressure. I think there's a group of guys around the country, man, that they called it a career a little bit too early, that, yeah. that, that still have something in them and, and could show up and make it dent. And I think it's fun. I think it's fun when that happens, and I think the fans get behind it and – uh I think it's a cool thing. I, I think a lot of the guys call it a career because there's just no financially. You can't do it. Unless you're the head assistant coach at one of the universities, which every year we're losing universities that have wrestling. Unless you have some big financial backer, you just can't make ends meet by being this wrestler. So you have to go get a, you know, get a regular job. And, and, and a lot of guys yeah. are like, I'm going to get out of wrestling, go do MMA because I can keep competing, keep training, keep learning. But then I'll make money actually getting punched in the head and getting hurt and being sore and having to go to training camp as opposed to like make, making $1,000 a month you know, because I'm on I'm number three, you know, on the Olympic ladder or whatever they're paying now at USA Wrestling, you know? Yeah, no, that's exactly right. That, that, you know, that, that, that is a struggle of, of amateur sports for sure. And, and when MMA came around, particularly in wrestling, it gave these guys a different avenue to go. But, uh, but you know, it, it, there is a major upside. A lot of these guys, Johnny Hendricks, these guys are in fantastic shape and, and they're still in a college wrestling room each day. So, you're in great shape. You're going to go work out. Why not just do it in a tournament instead of going to going to practice for two hours that day? Why not go and get as many six minute matches in as you can? It only costs you twenty five bucks to enter. So you're right to make that dedication and to do that. I, I do really admire those. Did you see Foxcatcher? Let me switch gears a little. Did you watch Foxcatcher? I'm having a hard time. I'm part of the SAG voting committee, um, so I have the I have the DVD at the house. They sent it to me already. I'm having a hard time watching because remember I was at the University of Oklahoma, getting ready to wrestle Marcus Malika from Arizona State University. He was ranked number two at the time, or number one at the time. Um, and Schultz brothers both left UCLA and went to, when they closed down their program, and came to the University of Oklahoma, and they both won national champs there. And we got the news that David had been shot. Now, I know Channing, personally, through, through Randy, because we hung out in, in, uh, in New Orleans with him, 
I know, obviously, Dave, and I know Mark very well. It's tough for me to go watch this movie. I'm not sure if I'm going to watch it without having a full 24 hours of decompress after I've seen it because I know the reality of the story. I know that the backlash and the outcome that happened to the wrestling community after this, this whole incident happened with Fox Catcher falling apart. So I'm really having an internal struggle of, okay, I got to sit down and watch this, but I'm going to need, I'm giving, I'm trying to give myself a 24 hour period after I watch it where I can be left alone to kind of decompress with it. Obviously you've seen it. What do you think? Well, I have seen it, but you know, you're the first person to tell me that, uh, uh, Frank, I asked Les Gutchess if he saw it and he not only hasn't seen it, he's not going to for the exact reasons that you said. He, he says he's, he's played it through in his head so many times and it makes his stomach sick and he's, he's just not going. Though he's in full support and thrilled that Hollywood made a, a wrestling movie, he, he just personally can't do it. So, you know, speaking of that, I actually talked to Xander Schultz, Dave's oh, son, yeah. and he did go see it. And he said, you know, it was terrible. He's like, the, the movie's great. I'm thrilled that they honored my father, but I know how it's going to end, and now I'm going to have to watch it. And, and he did. He did watch it. And, you know, as you can imagine, it, 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 it was bad. It, well, it was pretty I bad. Know, but I want to know look, how Nancy dealt with it. If she's seen it, how she dealt with it, she, I can't even imagine her going to see it, to be honest with you. I can't even think, like, she'd want to go see this movie. I got to find out, you know, it's, it's, it's so tough. And it really, for me, just thinking about it just makes me so angry and so violent. Like, I just want to, I want to grab that little rat by his neck and shake the shit out of him and smash his head off a of concrete until his, until his skull is crushed. Because I'm just so mad at how this whole thing fell apart. And then you're like, well, he's mentally, you know, he's got a mental problem. Like, what are you going to do? Kind of thing. It's just like... It's emotional roller coaster for me, this movie. Yeah. And, you know, she's another one that never gets talked about, but Nancy was portrayed very well in this movie. Her, her scenes were a little bit more limited, but the actress that played her, uh, you know, not only had great mannerisms, they, they, they did her hair and makeup. It, it looked like her, it, it was really well done. And that's the thing that's, if you do see it, one of the takeaways you'll have from, an artistic standpoint is is how much the actors nailed it. I mean, Ruffalo and Channing Tatum, it, it was perfect. It, and as perfect as they did, they failed in comparison to what Steve Carell did with DuPont. It, it just, it, it was so spot on mannerisms and body language and attitude and, and again, the hair and makeup to, to make him look just like him. It was, it, it was truly remarkable and I hope that he's honored when the Academy Awards come around. I fear that he won't be though. I fear not enough people know the story to know just how well he portrayed it. Well, my, my whole thing is, is I've got a couple of more weeks. I've got to watch it so I can vote on it. And I, and I want to make sure I do it right by watching it to force, I have to force myself to watch it and then be able to put a, a solid vote behind it. You know, is it, is it, you know, the best, best screenplay written? Is it the mo motion picture of the year? Like where, where does it fall in my ranking system. So I, I'm going to have to watch it at some point. I'm just kind of delaying it. And it's unfortunate because it, it's, it is the movie that kind of sets and says, hey, look, this is what happens, you know, in amateur wrestling is one of the biggest stories that ever hap happened in amateur wrestling in the States and kind of what goes on with it. And, and I want to, I want to be part of that group to make a solid vote for it when it comes time. Yeah. yeah and you won't regret watching it. The, the anger that you have now will be, renewed it will be exemplified because it, it is so accurate to the way things went down and it's just going to remind you and refresh you of things that you've forgotten but uh it, it is worth it and, and, and as wrestlers we're not going to get another movie man what's the last movie we had uh vision, vision quest, quest so yeah. it just isn't going to happen again and, and and you will have an appreciation have you seen mark schultz's response to it i mean he's had yeah. everything from rave reviews to absolute meltdowns yeah yeah, he's he's uh, he sometimes comes off to me as a little, I haven't talked to him in years. It's unfortunate because we used to talk quite a bit, you know, running around in the early MMA scene, and now we really don't talk that much at all. And and it's unfortunate because it seems like sometimes I'm watching these these reports and his these things that he's saying. It's like almost like he's having a mini meltdown sometimes. And sometimes you're like, it's just amazing what he's saying about the movie. So I can't really tell which way he's he's uh he's going with with this and where he really feels about it, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's hard, it's hard to tell, and, and he, some of his comments, even, even if they are accurate, I feel like he's missed the mark a little bit. He was mad they didn't talk about his 1985 World Championship or his, his UFC fight, but, uh, 
Yeah. I, I, I mean, it was so incredible. The, the portrayal they did, I, I thought it was incredible. He, he saw some different things and thought there was innuendos for things that I, as a viewer, didn't pick up on. Yeah. So I think it might be a situation where he was a little close to the trees to see the forest on this. He, he, he's probably seen the movie 20 times, and his takeaway just isn't what the general public's is. But, uh, you know, like you said earlier, man, it, it's a tough thing. It's a tough thing for you and I just you know, as, as fans on the outside going, imagine his brother. Yeah, I know, right? Like, he's, he's got to be falling apart. Well, let, let's change topics under a, under a lighter note. Let's talk about uh, Jones and, and uh, Cormier. First, uh, the Twitter, your Twitter post from 2012 with you drinking the can, talking about John Jones, or the can of Coke, talking about John Jones. Now he gets popped for Coke, you know, uh, in, a, in an out-of-competition situation and oversight by the Athletic Commission to even test him for cocaine because it's not illegal for him to be on it. Um, really, are you surprised that he got caught for something like that? Well, uh, this, this is what I'd say on that. If, if, if John has an addiction, I think we can all at least agree he doesn't want to. Right. <laughs> we can at least agree that, that, that he even privately is, is ashamed of it and wishes that, that, that it was out of his life. So, you know, the fact that he did get caught, and, and maybe that's what it takes to kind of shake a guy... Uh, you know, check into rehab. These, these really are good things. They're embarrassing. But a couple of years from now, if not sooner, he will look back and go, oh, man, I'm so, I'm so grateful that that happened. I'm so grateful that, you know, I was able to make that, that correction in my life. So yeah, that's kind of where I'm at with that. I, I, I understand that it's very confusing for people and, and, and the commission's rules and, and it get a little bit complicated and they even make you scratch your head at times. But, that there is an upside, which is, you know, John is a, is a person. I got to know him on the set of the, the Ultimate Fighter. I did not like him. I prejudged him, and I judged him wrong. When I got to know him, he was just a really nice guy, and he, he, he cared about his team. He was a, a, kind of a humble guy, uh, and, you know, really not what you would think. And so, you know, if, if in his own life he, he, he's got some demons that uh, that maybe he needed the motivation to be embarrassed publicly to shake loose, and Man, I say good for him. Good for him, and uh, let, let's let's help him get through this, and we'll worry about the sports secondary. Does it really matter for his for his legacy, his reputation? Is this going to help, hurt, or does it do nothing at all? Does it does it not matter really? Well, only time will tell that. I I, I think in large part it it does not matter. I think that you know there are times in life where you you get a redo. And and he's a very young guy, and uh, you know, with age, you kind of you kind of get a redo, you kind of get a start over at times. I, I, he needs that, but uh, you know, I mean, he he really is just a regular guy, and, and he got put in a super position of uh, of success and and everything else. But at the end of the day, he's just a regular guy trying to make it and working hard and trying to beat guys, and he is going to have some of these human errors. This is a big one. I don't want to downplay it, but I think John agrees. I don't think we need to prove the point that, that he needs to, uh, you know, change his life. I think he agrees. And he checked himself into rehab and he's taken his lumps. And, and you know, so for now, I think the important thing, you never kick a guy when he's down. No, no matter what and no matter who it is, you don't kick a guy when he's down. And so I think right now, you know, you get behind him and that's where we're at. Did Cormier have the best game plan? Did it look like against him when it, when the fight actually came together? Yeah, yeah, he he absolutely did. If you're going to appreciate what John Jones did uh, to Cormier, you have to one understand how good Cormier is, and two understand that Cormier fought the perfect fight. He did exactly what he said he was going to do. You know, Cormier was picking this fight with him because he said, "Man, I can get inside, and I'm the one guy that can get him down and keep him there." I'm the one guy that can get an underhook, push him into the fence, and keep him there. And that's exactly what he went out and tried to do. He didn't deviate from his plan. He stayed in his face. He kept the pressure on. He closed, excuse me, closed that distance. But what he found out, much like I did and so many other people did, is it's just a special talent. John Jones is a very rare and special talent. And when you grab a hold of him, you feel it really quick. And, and, and I thought Cormier did a great job of sticking to his plan, which was to continue to press forward, continue to throw punches, continue uh, to get within John's reach. Uh, what he didn't know and what 
I didn't know as a viewer is that that John would still be able to to be successful. You know, John John forced the quench a number of times. So many people said Daniel has to get to the quench. Hey, John gave it to him. John's the one that stepped forward a number of times and grabbed Daniel. So uh, John, I mean, John is the best to have ever done it by a lot. Um, you know, whoever the next best guy is, there, there's a huge gap. John is just simply the best guy to have ever fought. Is he? Is he? Then you have him pound for pound. You know, uh, the best, the best number one right now. Yes. Is is John the best pound for pound? Yeah. Is that what you're asking me? Yeah. Yeah, and not only the best right now, he's the best ever. Um, and, and I have a feeling that over time that's going to get tested. He's either going to go up to, to heavyweight and uh, take on Velasquez, or Weidman's going to move up to 205 and take on John. Uh, I think that those super fights will get made. I think there's a big regret uh, in the UFC that they never put St. Pierre and Anderson together or that they never put Matthews and Anderson together. They talked about it and didn't do it. And uh, I think that's going to change. I think we're going to start to see those those super fights and champion versus champion. I have no insight to that. I haven't even heard the rumor of it. I just I know combat sports generally go that way. Boxing does it all the time. I think I think the UFC will start to get into that too. And, and John actually will show us that he could change weight classes and and still be dominant. So well, I think the difference yeah, man, is he, he's the best. The difference is now is with St. Pierre's, like, he was like, hey, I'm too small. I only weigh 185 pounds when I'm in training camp. Like, I'm too small. He, he really, GSP really didn't embrace the idea of having this fight. And, and Hughes and, and, and Silva deal just couldn't get, just couldn't come together. But I think with John Jones, who's like, I'll fight Cain Velasquez right now. Like, I'll, next week, let's put this fight together. Like, he's a guy that wants to fight and, and, and to have these things happen. And, and Weidman would love to move up and fight him. Like, it's like, so now we have a situation where guys – would love to move up and fight these guys at different weight classes. As before, guys were kind of like, eh, maybe not. I'm too small. I'm not really sure this is going to work for me. Like, now guys are like, screw it. I wanted to find out if I am the best guy, you know, on the, on the planet. I'm going to prove it by going up there and beating a heavyweight. I'll prove it by going up to 205. So, I agree with you. I think it's going to change. I think it's going to be a whole different format coming coming very soon, coming middle of this year. I think we're going to start having conversations about these super fights. Yeah. I, I, don't, see, I don't see why they want it. You know, Jose Aldo's in the same spot. Really struggling to make 145 pounds. He was struggling years ago to make 145 pounds, but that's where his contract was at. He talked about fighting Pettis. Pettis has talked about fighting him. I mean, yeah. you know, whether it's champion versus champion or, or all those just flat out moves up a weight class, I, I think all across the board in the UFC, we're going to start seeing, uh, you know, some different parity. Even with Daniel Cormier, you know, this is the one thing that was, was not talked about leading into the fight, but I think it should have been. That was Cormier's one shot. At yeah. his age, at 36 years old, he's not getting another title fight. That yeah. was it. And, and if he won it, then, you know, of course he would to defend it, but he's not getting one as a contender unless there's some some odd variables that go on. Right. Uh, you know, somebody gets hurt or pulls out and he, and he becomes the guy. So for Cormier, to get a fresh coat of paint, you can do that. You just have to change the vision. Uh, he's not going to go to heavyweight because he's he's also one of Kane's coaches, not only his friend and teammate, but he's he's actually coached with Corn Man. He's not going to go up there. Uh, and in college, if you remember, he's a hundred and eighty four pounder. So you know to go up to one eighty five, and I think he I think he would immediately get a title shot there. I think if he announced he was going down, him and Weidman would would, would be front page news instantly. How can he make? I mean, can he make 85 again? I mean, remember, he was struggling for a long time to, to, to get down to 205 and was having problems getting down there. Do you think he can make another 20-pound drop? You know, I think, yeah, he could. He definitely has the weight to lose. Uh, you know, when we talk to guys like Mike Dolce and stuff, they're very confident they could get in there. But to your point, it would require significant discipline. Uh, the good news is he – He's not any bigger now than he was in college, at least in terms of height. He, you know, he's not any taller now, uh, and yeah, his body put on some weight, but he could take that right back off. He graduated college at 23 years old. He was basically full-grown man, and he was 184-pounder and competing on an hour weigh-in, which means, you know, for the, for the listeners, he weighs in a one hour later, he's in the ring. In the MMA situation, you weigh in, you're in the ring 30 hours later. So his recovery time would do it. He could definitely compete well. Uh, but it, it would take some discipline. He'd have to really, really want to do it. And, uh, you know, he's the kind of guy, I think he does. I think he does really want to do it. I, I really think that that's going to be 
a move in the fairly near future, somewhere in 2015. I, yeah. I think Cormier goes down to 185 pounds. I like to see it. I would definitely like to see him down back at a, at a tighter, fitter, more 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 stature esque body weight for him. You know, like really down at you know walking around at, at 200. 205 and cutting down to to 85 for these fights like i think that he'd be a much better athlete you know at, at that at that space and i think you're right he'd be he'd be in that in that wheelhouse very very quickly last question yeah. before i let you out of here though uh conor mcgregor he obviously is looking he's looking he's not saying he's looking past dennis Siever, he's looking through him you know to go because he wants to battle jose aldo do you think that that Conor has a skill set to beat a guy like Jose Aldo and, and, and now put himself in position to be the guy that, that everyone's going to start talking about in a pound-for-pound pound you know, pound pound ranking system because he's kind of run his way through the division? It would surprise me. I think that Conor's the real deal. I think uh, he, he truly is a top-five guy. I think the, the top three in that weight class are as nasty as they come. The, the Jose Aldo, Chad Mendes, Frankie Edgar – uh, I would be surprised if he could beat them, but I, I would tune in to find out. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, some other guys really think he's the guy. Kenny Florian, who's challenged at those weight classes, really thinks that Connor, with his striking and awkward angles, uh, with his pressure and shape and fitness, that, that, that he could uh, could beat Aldo. I, I just keep being more and more impressed with Jose Aldo every time he fights. Nobody needs Connor McGregor more than Jose Aldo. Uh, although it's the second best fighter in the world, in my opinion, pound for pound next to John Jones. He's also the, the, the single worst drawing champion in UFC history. Right. He sells less pay-per-views and less tickets than anybody. That'll change, you know, if, if you remember, and, and I know you do, Chuck Liddell was a terrible draw right. at one point, and he kept winning, he kept winning, and people just weren't getting behind him. All of a sudden, one day, that changed, and he went from, uh, you know, from a poor draw to to the biggest star in the in the industry, and that same thing can happen. The same thing happened with Floyd Mayweather. Yeah. Floyd Mayweather wasn't the huge draw. He came out to Portland, Oregon, my hometown, and fought. They they gave tickets away, and they still only got five thousand people in the building. And all of a sudden, it just kind of happened overnight. The the the, the switch flipped, and uh, you know, his star rise. His skills are the same. He he was as great of a fighter back then as he is now, but. uh you know, for whatever reason, what it takes to make a star is a really tough recipe to follow. And hey, can Connor beat those top three? I, I don't know. I'm not willing to say no. I'm not willing to say that he can, but I'm not willing to say that he can't. I think that what he's already achieved is impressive. You know, fighting in a main event in your third UFC fight in your home country is a monumental task that has not been asked of anybody. And you know, not only did he accept it, but he got his opponent out of there in less than five minutes. So, yeah, yeah. you know, that right there proves he's, he's not only got the physical, but he's got the mental thing down, too. And that's that's hard, man. It's hard to have them both. Yep. Well, there you have it. That's Chael Sonnen. Got him on vacation. Spent 30 minutes with us. Hopefully he can go back and enjoy a couple more Mai Tais with his family. <laughs> ah, I'm a Coca-Cola man myself, but I, I will put one ice and th- uh, on ice and think of you, Frank. <laughs> I appreciate that, bud. Hey, I'll, uh, I definitely expect to be seeing you here in a couple of weeks when you come into Vegas for the uh, uh, Silva and Diaz fight. Cool. I'll get a hold of you, buddy. All right, man. I'll talk to you later.